Passport to America is in stock. Children's Atlas of the USA is also now in stock and shipping. And over time, we'll see growth happening. To expect perfection out of the gate, I think is unrealistic. And I think we have to teach our children um, realistic expectations. The Bible is absolute truth. We can put our trust in it, and then we look for evidence to support it. And even when we don't understand the evidence, it really doesn't matter because our wisdom is limited. I can end with science. We're all looking at the evidence, and we're pursuing truth. Now, what truth are we pursuing? Well, there's only one absolute truth. Teach, teach the child you have. Let, let, um, let her work in the math that she's working on. The goal is learning. It, it, grade levels mean nothing. It's insane the number of orders we have coming in and then how hard the guys are working to stay mm -hmm. on top of it is uh, it's it's insane the whole company is kind of shifted which is awesome but um, marketing is now customer service and support but somehow I'm in checking orders going into boxes so it's cool to see what everybody's ordering anyway all hands on deck. I know it's interesting to see different people's names that we recognize coming through. Like, oh, I recognize this person's name. Interesting to got that and that. <laughs> it is. It is. Although there's so many coming in right now. It's just... Uh... I see a lot of people jumping in over at the app. Uh, some of us had a conversation before we went live. It was like the VIP chat before the live stream because Jess, Barbara, Vicky, and I keep trying to beat each other to be the first comment, and Jess has beat us um, today and Thursday. It was a little bit of pre chat, pre chatter, pre video chatter. chatter. Pre video so chatter. So join us for pre chatter next time. And then if you are watching on Facebook, please drop a comment. Um, I'm not seeing any comments come in so far, so please just drop a comment and let us know that Facebook is working. Yep. Uh, as far as Facebook goes, we did just switch over to a new way of doing it now. We are approving uh, all of the posts have to be approved before they go onto the feed. We have this huge influx of new uh, families homeschooling. I think last week there were over a thousand people that joined the Moms of Master Books and trying to keep the group moving in the same direction and keeping the quality of conversation, not having outside conversation, all that type of stuff. Um, we had to shift over a little bit, but it seems to be working well. So um, yeah, we're excited about that. Hey, I'm gonna, before we jump into the question and answers real quick, I'm just gonna show Adventures in Creation in the Physical World it has arrived. It showed up a couple of days ago. The truck brought uh, pallets of this, and so this is in stock now and shipping. Uh, this would be for recommended for lower upper lower elementary. So I'd say anywhere from first, second, third grade, this would be awesome. The Passport to America is in stock. Um, this is just a fun, fun book. There's previews on the website of this book, and so Passport to America is now up. And Children's Atlas of the USA is also now in stock and shipping. So those three books have arrived. I've been told that uh, God's Design, Heaven and Earth for Beginners is supposed to arrive tomorrow, as is Practice Makes Perfect Level 1 for Math Lessons. Um, so. And they smell incredible because I know half of you are wondering. Um, <laughs> the Adventures in the Physical World is the strongest smelling one. I think because of the, on the pages, there's so much color in that book. It's gorgeous. Look at all that color. Imagine how good that book smells. <laughs> it does. This have. is, and they keep dropping the books off in the office, and Josh did it too. He's like, <sighs> <laughs> that's funny. Uh, okay. All right, jumping into, I don't know if Facebook comments are working. I just have to look at them on my phone. So they're not Sorry. working on here. Mm -hmm. So, so comment on Facebook and I will read them off of my phone. So. Facebook. 
come on Facebook. Um, in the app, Jamie asked, she said, I have a question about the pre-K curriculum, Stepping Stones, we're a homeschooling family. I also babysit two grandsons three days a week. My almost three-year-old grandson was showing interest in school this past year when we were doing school. I kept him busy with coloring, Play-Doh, etc. Do you think he would be too young to start this curriculum? How old was he? Three, almost three-year-old grandson. Almost three? I think he'd be a little young. I mean, you could test it and let him do a little bit, maybe repeat it again next year. Um, you know, maybe do the, some of the activities, but uh, that's really designed more for um, kind of a, a four, four-year-old. So I think that that's mm -hmm. probably a little young. Jess said, book sniffers of Master Books Unite. And Irina said, yeah, we need that fresh smell of Master Books. <laughs> you get a Master Books candle that just smells like... That's a good idea. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Anyways. Um, Casey said, what are some good reading goals to set for a second and third grader? Something to challenge them and help them want to read. Uh, you know, at these ages, I don't think you want to push too hard because you don't want, you don't want that mindset that the, in the brain that, um, reading is, is awful. So I think what I would do is really kind of test, like, what are they interested in? You know, when, when our kids get interested in a subject, they become voracious readers. And all we have to do is just keep feeding the fire. So what are the interests he has? Um, you know, is there fiction? Like, oh, there's some different series that we've used with our family. I can't think. There's some Od Adventures in Odyssey type series. Uh, oh, I don't remember. There's a couple of that. Amelia Bedelia, I think, was it that one? Mm -hmm. There's a couple of different series. We use the YWAM series, but we don't really push too hard for that because every one of the kids once they kind of got a feel for ooh this is exciting this is entertaining they they took it we didn't really have to push it we just had to kind of expose them to a lot of different stuff until we saw them you know i have one son that if it's if it's hunting fishing uh trapping making something outdoors mm -hmm. or wild animals he'll read all day long Another loves fictional stories, and if the two had to read, if I forced my one son to have to read fictional stories, I think it would just about kill him. So, um, but he'll he'll ask me to get these huge books that he can read. So, yeah. Over the Facebook live stream, Mary asked. Uh, she said, "Is there a dad's master books group?" My husband wants to know. There isn't. We tried it, and unfortunately, us dads just weren't very good at it. So. Um, we're open to trying it again, but uh, it sat kind of empty. And because of the way the app worked, we just, we didn't want to, we, we kind of tested some, and if they didn't have momentum, then we let them, we let them go. But in the app, it's not, in the app, it's not Moms of Master Books. It's the Master Books app. So dads are welcome to jump into any of the conversations there. I am there. Um, I know there are other dads that are part of the conversation as well in the app. Jess, who's also in the app watch room right now, she said, how do you handle a kid who is a perfectionist? My daughter, Macy, is a perfectionist and will get angry if she thinks something doesn't look absolutely perfect. I told her nobody is perfect, but that hasn't really sunk in. Macy will get so upset that she will almost rip up her paper if she doesn't think it looks absolutely perfect. Macy is a first grader now and is six. I'm sure you and your wife have had this experience and know some tricks. Thank you so much. What say you, what perfectionist? Say I, I don't know. I think just... Putting her in situations where she's able to be messy. Where it's For anybody being... who doesn't know, this is my daughter. Uh... And so I'm deferring. She's a perfectionist. So I'm deferring to her because yes. the thing said, you and your wife. And then I'm like, what and do then you what think? do I think? Yeah. Well, so... I'm not his wife, but I am his daughter. And I was the in the same boat. I can't tell you how many days I would just get so frustrated and start crying. It wasn't really until I was a little bit older that um, once I was kind of given a fly flying around my head. Once I was kind of given um, and put in situations where it was okay to fail and that it was I needed to purposefully just be messy. It wasn't going to matter what the outcome was. Um, and art is one of those things that you can just do that gets messy. It's There's no rules, no boundaries, you know. It's hard for some people, though. If there are lines, they want to color in the lines. I know. So just, yeah. I don't know, putting her in situations where it's okay to be messy. I think having conversations too, realistic conversations, there's nothing in life that's perfect. 
there may be moments that we have that feel perfect, but there's not. And I think giving room for growth. So you do your best, mm -hmm. and then whatever that looks like, we work on next time, we do our best on that. And, and over time, we'll see growth happening. To expect perfection out of the gate, I think is unrealistic. And I think we have to teach our children um, realistic expectations for all of us. And it can be hard for some students who really want to please and do a good job to think that they're not meeting that. Right. But I think it can be real unhealthy if you don't, if you don't kind of work with that. Yeah, I re listened to a podcast recently too where they were like, at the end of every day when the family was like eating dinner or everything, the dad would ask, um, how did you guys fail today? Like he, they celebrated the fails or the situations that they put them, the kids put themselves into to potentially fail, mm -hmm. and he was almost like disappointed if they didn't do something that had the potential to fail. I just thought that was interesting. I, I know some top failures. performers that actually may try to make one failure a week, mm -hmm. where they'll do something so big that they know they can't, but they know they'll learn from it, and but that way, mm -hmm. their mind is not, they don't fear failure so badly that it cripples them. Right, and Anderson said, letting your kids see you make mistakes and your reaction is helpful too, recovering perfectionistic over here. Yeah, we get what we lead and that's definitely mm -hmm. something that, um, giving our best and not getting upset when, when we don't have Yeah, for sure. Ava said, how can current homeschool parents be encouraging to new homeschoolers? I already have two friends that have committed to making the switch this year. Well, I think, Okay, so let me speak to those of us who are in the homeschool community. We've been established here. There's homeschoolers and then there's crisis schoolers. Crisis schoolers are, are, are going to start homeschooling because of state legislation and fear of COVID and different things like that. That's a different mindset, but I'm excited because when we look through history and we look through scripture, we see that plagues and famines and, and different, um, you know, um, political things that were happening moved people to new areas. And I think as a homeschool community, we have this huge opportunity of people who never would have considered homeschooling are all of a sudden beginning, they're open to it. Now it can be a little frustrating because I think the homeschool world could change, right? Because we have all this mass of people now that are homeschooling for different motivations, different reasons. Our Facebook group has been inundated by a new wave of people who are asking different types of questions, have different, um, just a different demeanor than the, than the homeschool community. I've had to really take this position of saying, well, praise the Lord that he's given us this huge opportunity to speak into the lives of all these families mm -hmm. and really help be a guide to them. And I think part of what we do is just encouraging them. Just saying, the first year is hard, you're going to get this. You know, just an encouragement. It was hard for me, but you just keep working until you, you get kind of figured out. So I think that that's one thing we can do. Um, and, then, and then I think we just have to allow the Holy Spirit to do what He does as well. And, and so some of these families, you know, we don't need to fix them. We just need to let, mm -hmm. let happen what happens homeschooling and being with your kids 24 7 can uh it can be like sandpaper right it can it can rub off some of the rough edges and so just i think encouraging them you don't have to be perfect you don't have to school at home you you the purpose of of why we do this is to be able to um to disciple and train and, and to prepare our kids and also to shield them from from some of the things that um, they're too young to be exposed to and have to deal with at this age. So we're preparing them. Yeah. So, okay. Cool. Curly over in the app said, Hi, we're about to attempt homeschooling for the first time this year. We feel our child is in between years forward slash books. Is it best to just get both books? Yeah, depending on how last year ended for you, um, you may want to get the, the lower book, especially if you're elementary and um, just let them go through at a faster rate. Just say, this is review. We just want to make sure we solidify some things that maybe got missed last year and all the craziness. Uh, you know, we, you don't have to be a stickler. Like, we would call them learning gaps. 
where maybe they miss something that's going to be foundational. I wouldn't worry about it in social studies and science. I would only look at it in language and math, maybe maybe just dropping back to let them accelerate and do it a little bit faster than um, the normal. This was asked over in the live stream of the app and on Facebook. They said, when can we expect heaven and earth for beginners? And then in addition to that, Anderson would like to know if you think it's appropriate for a kid who's terrified of bad weather. Great question. I don't know about that. Um, I, I haven't looked at it from that angle. It's supposed to be here tomorrow, so uh, it should be on the website. It should. Week. I mean, reading about weather is safer than experiencing weather, so I would imagine like that there's, there's a safety in that. I would pick up this book, the weather book, uh, that explains how weather operates and um, just different things that you have, how safety, there's safety tips in it, uh, understanding what they see. Now there are some scary pictures as far as tornadoes and stuff that go through, but um, I think uh, <laughs> I think it's a good book of here's the weather and the way it looks. So. Awesome. I'm um, upset. I have a co-author considering writing strands. My question is about the reading weeks for this curriculum. She said, they will be taking the placement test, and I imagine there will be varying levels. My guess is students would be would test between beginner two and intermediate two. I'm wondering if they could all do the same Bible passages during the reading weeks. So they each do writing at their level in their own books, per master books, copyright, uh, but would read and decipher the same Bible passages. Absolutely. Do the reading passages or the questions relate to them becoming increasingly difficult or relate to the writing proportions specifically? Um, they cover different topics, right? So in one you might be covering the, the person, and in the other you may be covering the place. So I, 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 I think you could modify it as definitely. Use the writing to address one, and then on the reading weeks or reading assignment, just adapt it to be multi-age. Awesome. Sarah asked, do you have a suggestion for a telescope that would go with the astronomy course? I never knew there were so many differences in telescopes. Thanks. In the Stargazer book, uh, Jason Lyle does talk about telescope types and what to buy. If you message the help desk at masterbooks.com, I believe Anna has um, an answer already prepared for what to buy for telescopes and that type of thing. So awesome. I recommend doing that. Tiffany said, I have a 16 year old dyslexic. 16, yeah, 16 year dyslexic old who is having trouble using spelling. When we take the test for spelling, he does well, but he doesn't apply the words he has learned and knows how to spell to his writing and every other subject or even in text. It drives me crazy. I'm all for abbreviations, but people is not P E P O L. How do I redirect the coalition? Um, this has been an ongoing issue. It's not new. Any good advice? Spelling, Kristen. Uh, my wife will often say spelling is just one of those things there are good spellers there are not good spellers thankfully in where we live in this day and age we have spell check on almost everything to correct us um, which is helpful and i know that we want our kids to be able to spell uh, i would say don't think that the ability to spell or the inability to spell is going to affect somebody's success in life our, our boss is brilliant. He doesn't always spell right. But that's what's funny because he owns a publishing company. Now he has people to check spelling and he has editors and, and proofers and everything else. So that, didn't, that doesn't come into effect. But um, just as an example, I think, uh, you know, it's complex. Spelling is complex. Especially when we learn to spell phonetically, it can become very difficult then to try to spell some things. Yeah. And I don't know if that answered anything, but I mean, I think I filled so. it in. I filled it in with words. Okay, good yeah. job. Thank you. High five. Jill said, "When will the new U.S. Geography and Social Studies course be available for purchase?" Well, the two books, Children's Atlas and Passport, are available now. I know that they're rushing to get the teacher guide done. So hopefully August is when that's expected to be available. 
Cater S. She said, we really appreciate Masterbook's unapologetic creation stance. I majored in archaeology in college and used, 100, used to 100% believe in evolution. But through answers in Genesis and other materials, I now understand the scientific evidence for creation. My question is, out there in the secular world, evolution is totally accepted as scientific truth, and people who don't believe it are ridiculed and dismissed. How do we educate our children in creation, but also prepare them for the fact that they will be the minority as they go out into the world, especially if they go to college? I would like my kids to be respectful of evolutionists, but also know how to defend their position. Is there a master books curriculum that would prepare kids for these issues? Well, all of master books, especially our science, interweaves creation science and the evidence in view of a biblical worldview. So if you're doing master book science, your kids are doing it, they're going to be pretty solidly prepared for that argument. I think it's important to know the psychology a little bit. We all have a confirmation bias. Um, this week, I got a call from somebody who is upset about a position we take on another uh, religion as being a cult. And um, as I began to explain the position, there was it, was, it was quite upsetting to this person to hear what I was saying because we're looking for things that confirm what we believe. So with science, we've been taught, if we went to public school or, or listened to Bill Nye the Science Guy or watched the Science Channel or the History Channel, we've been taught the, the phrase millions of years ago. And that's... We look at the Science Channel like that's the truth, and then we see the Bible, and we've looked at it more like it was stories or something that, you know, it's just, it's, we put our hope there, but, but the truth is in science. So I think it's important that we teach, we understand. There's a confirmation bias, and if, if you believe in evolution, you're going to look for evidence and truths that support your confirmation bias. And if, if you believe in the Word of God, you're going to look for evidence that supports your bias. And so it's very difficult, though, when somebody believes something solidly, to shift them from that. Um, I think that we can, we can begin to evaluate and say, I believe the Bible is the Word of God, it's the truth. And, he, and, and we do have a decision to make, because many Christians will say, well, I don't think it's that big of an issue. Okay, so basically, we, we take... In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. He did it all in six days. When he got done, he said, it is good. It is good. And, and everything was good until man sinned. And then when man sinned, a curse came to the world and to man. And so if you take sickness, disease, death, all that was incorporated in the curse, and you put it before all of that, then you're saying God called all of this good. And what's the need for Jesus? Because... It, it doesn't fit. The timetable doesn't fit. It also doesn't fit the days of creation. People will say, a day is, is a thousand years. A day is, is a thousand years. And I, I, it's, it's, well, it also says, and a thousand years is, is a day. It doesn't say anywhere about a million years is a day or a billion years. That's, that's nowhere in Scripture anyway, anyhow. But here's the thing. What was created on day three? Oh, look at me. Plants. So plants were created on day three. What was created on day four? The sun. How do you have plants created the day before the sun? Now you could, plants could be created and live until day four when the sun and the stars were created, but you can't do that for billions of years. So you would have to take that and say, well, the Bible really doesn't mean this. See, you start running into issues when you take the Bible and you try to put it into man's theology. So that's a problem. And the reason that man's theology is, is what it is with evolution is it basically says through time and chance, go to you, we're all here by accident. And that everything is relative and we, we can create our own beliefs and rules and all of that. It's a very dangerous proposition because now I can set the rules. And when somebody is adamant about believing that or science is, like with my kids, one of the things I say is every time we've watched TV together and, you know, some, if you or someone you love to have been injured by, da, 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 that's what science, that's science. It's fallible. Scientists created the technology, they invented something, and they tested it, but it didn't work, and people got hurt or died or something, and now there are lawsuits. That's science. Science is the pursuit of truth, it's not truth. 
And so we have to be careful. The Bible is absolute truth. We can put our trust in it. And then we look for evidence to support it. And even when we don't understand the evidence, it really doesn't matter because our wisdom is limited. I can only see what I can experience right here. I don't have experience to, you know, the days of creation. I wasn't there. So everything that I, I have to take something by faith and I take his word, of, the word of God by faith. And then I trust that. And then with science, we're all looking at the evidence and we're pursuing truth. Now, what truth are we pursuing? Well, there's only one absolute truth. So kind of beginning to work with your kids and understanding that when you hear millions of years, that's an excuse, but it doesn't fit because if you look at the Bible and we believe the Bible to be true, you just can't have the sun a million years after plants are created. Um, you also can't have sin, sickness, disease, and death prior to a good creation. So that causes a problem for those of us who believe in Jesus. Um, I mean, there's a lot of fun you can have with it and challenging somebody's bias, but at the end of the day, if they, if they uh, hold to that bias, they're going to look for evidence and arguments and things that will support their biases. Okay. That was long. It was. We're going to kind of continue on that a little bit. Okay. Um, Jess Reckler, and I know I saw earlier in here, I think she said this is one of her first live streams, which she's kind of caught. So hi. Hi, Jess. I'm glad that you made it today. She said, I had an experience recently in a general homeschooling Facebook page where I recommended Adventures in Creation and had people attack saying it's not real science and they prefer to teach actual science, not mythology. Um, I didn't really know how to respond. I just ended up letting it go because I didn't want an argument debate with a stranger on social media. Yeah. It's not really worth it. I, I, we've, we've had fun taunting the trolls it is part of the marketing thing that we do. Sometimes we'll put a book out and uh, inevitably there will be a troll that comes in and starts a big debate and they always help us move more books. At first it, it's weird. And then, but anyways, you don't win those debates. It's, it's you know. It's very difficult to win those debates. They don't win those debates either. We just go back and forth. Um, as far as mythology and what they're calling mythology, let, let's, what's the logic? You're saying millions or billions of years ago, there was a big bang and all of the matter in the universe, all of the matter in the universe came from a, a dot about the size of a period on a page had so much energy and then exploded. And from that, we have all of this. That is not mythology. <laughs> I mean, that's craziness. And then, and then look, at the, the, look at the odds of, of even human DNA. Look at the odds of anything even evolving. We haven't been able to duplicate that at all. We haven't been able to take the building blocks of life without any intervention and see them create. And there's irreducible complexities. There's things like the eyeball or the ear that are very complex that, that in any other instance, except if you're trying to justify a fairy tale, which is what I believe evolution is, if you were to do that, you would, you would have to come up with some, wow, just it just happened. But in any other setting, like, like for this cup that has purpose, it has a lid, has a handle, it's very well designed, right? It designed, it's very well designed. It does what it's supposed to do. That's creation. Creation is designed. Think about the fact that when you go to the Weather Channel, they can tell you what time the sun rises and what time it sets. So somebody who says they don't believe in mythology yeah, you absolutely do. It takes more faith to believe your fairy tale than it does to believe that there was a designer and, and, and that there's design that we see in nature. We don't always understand it, but to think it just happened from time and chance and, and whatever, it doesn't make any sense. Okay, um, over in the Facebook live stream, Missy said, my first year of homeschooling and I feel like I'm failing my 10 year old. Public schools have pushed along my daughter to now going into sixth grade despite my request of being held back so she can understand and interpret what she's learned. 
Well, fast forward, she's supposed to go into sixth grade, but mathematically she's third grade level. Do I start there and push through that to where she should be? Yep. Teach teach the child you have. Let let um, let her work in the math that she's working on. The goal is learning. It, it, grade levels mean nothing. The goal is learning. She wants to make sure that she shores up the skills that she's supposed to to continue building on that. The goal, you know, academically, we try to get a child prepared for algebra in ninth grade. Sometimes that doesn't happen. Sometimes it's 10th grade and you do pre-algebra. You're doing fine. In fact, if a school district pushed your student beyond where they were to keep her on grade level and ignored the fact that she was struggling, they failed her. Um, they're, you know, think about a child walking, right? If I expected my child to walk immediately and I, I take my, my baby and I set them down and I say, walk, what's, what do they do? They fall over. And, and walking is a process. Schooling is a process. Don't, don't take the mindset that just because you, you're doing school and, and they're a certain age that they should just be able to, to be set down and walk. It's, it's a growth process. And, and you want to be able to have that freedom. Give yourself the permission to say, we're growing in this. Mm -hmm. Some days you're going to stand up and you're going to take a couple steps. And we're going to applaud that. And we're going to celebrate that. And if you trip and stumble and fall over, it's not a big deal. Pick yourself up. Let's keep going. We can do this. Don't fall into, you know, comparison is a death of happiness. And, and we look at other people and we think that they've got everything together. Every homeschool is a mess at some point or another. We all have moments that we wonder if we're destroying our kids or we're capable and up to the task or what kind of adults are they possibly going to be. To idolize and believe that the public school has any better grasp of that, it doesn't. And the one thing you don't have is the peer pressure and the, end, the outside influences affecting even like a handicap that you have. So you're able to actually adjust and adapt faster. When I was a principal of a school, if we chose a bad curriculum, it didn't really matter. We had to stick with it for a couple of years because of the investment that the school had. As we homeschool, if we choose a bad curriculum, we're able to adapt very quickly and just choose a new curriculum. So give yourself a lot of permission for growth. It, you don't have to be perfect. You're not failing your child. If you're, if you're investing your, in your student and you care about your student and you're beginning to work with them, then then you're already ahead of, of what a, um, a very benign and cold school system is capable of. Awesome. Um, we haven't even, I mean, we're halfway through the questions in the app, so I'm we'll good. To I'm good. Rapid fire. We can go. Go. Okay. I'm trying. I'm trying to talk fast. Jessica said, I just saw that Alan's of Faith. What age group would this be recommended for? What was it? Elements of Faith? Elements of Faith is for junior high and ninth grade. It can be used as a pre-chemistry. She said, we're doing chemistry God's design with my 13-year-old. Could or should we incorporate this also? It looks like a great book. I would do it as a morning basket devotional. It's got unbelievable spiritual truth to it that will also complement what you're doing with science. The Cox family asks, schedule a routine for the day. This is our fourth year, fourth year and we are struggling. Second, um, language lessons two and math lessons level two in first grade, which is language and math. Um, do they do Life for Beginners, My Story, and More Than Words Together? First question. Life for Beginners, My, my story. story, and More Than Words, in addition to yes. language and math? Yes. And then Pre-K, which is Stepping Stones. Um, Think of it this way. You do four basic core subjects all throughout. Math, language, history, social studies, and science, right? So those are your four core. Then you can add electives. So more than words would be an elective. Or you could add a Bible course, like Elements of Faith. Um, well, more than words would be a Bible course too. But you could do another science course. You could do phys ed, art, music, anything like that as well. Those would be in addition to the basic four that you do as you set those up. As far as scheduling goes, yeah, we, we do schedule as a family. We, uh, nine o'clock is when the school day starts. There's scheduled breaks throughout, and we find that it's easier to do that because our lives are incredibly busy, and sometimes we're just not able to, 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 to motivate and tell everybody where to be. It's just expected. Be at your desk at nine o'clock and working on school during the day. Right. 
Tabitha said, what is your top course pick for a mom to do who went to public school and therefore didn't get the opportunity to do to do Master Books high school courses herself? Um, I don't know course-wise. I would definitely say the uh, Life Science Origins course um, for high schoolers is a really good course to yeah, kind of have. Yeah, I So that would probably be my... Uh, if I have it, I don't think I do. Um, those those books and the DVDs are really good. They were actually written to be very, here's the evidence, here's what uh, evolutionists believe, here's what mm -hmm. creationists believe, what do, you, what do you believe is more realistic based on the evidence? Yeah. And it's, I know um, uh, Anna, that course, she loved it because yeah, it really opened her eyes. She agrees too, so. Okay. Uh, Valerie asks, will you have video courses in the Masterbooks Academy for your biology course by fall 2021? Boy, I hope so. We're working hard to get a lot of courses in, and um, I'm excited by who the Lord has provided to begin doing science courses for us. I think mm -hmm. Applied Engineering is the first course he's working on. So, yep, okay. I'm hoping. Um, this is my first year. I have a third grader and a kindergartner. Um, besides the Simply K Math and Phonics, is there anything else that would be good for my kindergartner? And then anything extra besides a box set for the third grader? For your kindergartner, I would advise imaginative play. Play, play, play. Let them create and play and build and play. Let them um, just, they'll develop. Simply K is developmental. The Master Books approach is very developmental. If you look at countries that are way ahead of the U.S. in education like Finland, um, they don't even start education until age seven, but they do a lot of reading together where, where the adult will read a book, uh, a lot of play and, and imagination type things, building, constructing, developing motor skills. All of that is integral to brain development. And so we follow a little bit closer to that. Yeah. Uh, can you share future plans with high school math? I know Algebra 2 is postponed, and I was curious if there were more courses planned. In my state, students need four math credits. Our whole family currently six students love master books well we have we have the algebra 2 right now I'm not sure what the next courses will be um, but I think that there is a consumer business math that's also being proposed and in the works um, that we're, we're pretty close to so um, yeah um, Heather asked for a geography course recommendation for a high schooler um, I know that the uh, the Knowledge Quest books, I don't have any in here, I don't think. Um, the Explore, uh, like Explore the Earth, the Vikings, the, um, the different courses that are part of that series. Okay. I forgot the name of it. You know what I'm talking about? I've been reading through comments. The so. history that Ann Voskamp was the author of. Oh, the... Um Knowledge geography course. for quiz? Geography for children, is it? I know that that's multi-age. Child's know? geography. Child's geography. Thank you, Thank you Desiree. Desiree. The child's geography. So I'm calling a, I want a one helpline. Desiree Roderick. You get one helpline. One help <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, jumping into the Facebook post. Okay. Um, I'll just keep going until you think we're good to... We got, we're got. we going, we're going. Okay, Bridget said, is it best to do alternate... Is it best to just alternate the sciences throughout the years as kids get older? To alternate sciences? Mm -hmm. Not sure what that means. Laura jumped in, she said, I'm not sure what you mean by alternate the sciences, but what I have enjoyed with Master Books is the ability to select, select options based on ch children's interests. I also like the ability to reuse a course such as God's Design by doing an intro for, say, third or fourth, and then revisiting it in more in depth for seventh and eighth if the topic was of interest to a child. Perfect answer. Uh, Rachel said, we'd be adding more mat morning basket bubbles. We've talked about an animal basket because um, we have so many great books on animals. Mm -hmm. So we have that one, but um, uh, everything's kind of... We've worked really hard this year on getting the website, removing friction points, getting better descriptions, um, trying to make things... Uh, easier for people to understand so that's been the priority <clears throat> the morning baskets it's merchandising books that we have um, 
we may have one that'll come, but right now uh, everybody's either in the warehouse, working on reprints, or answering phones and emails. Yeah. All hands on deck. It is. This is like our, our break. This is our. That's why let's I'm come, like, keep going. Let's keep going, come hang out because as soon as we're done, you're coming back to the warehouse. Yeah, send me um, back to the dungeon. Danielle said, "Does a preschool teacher's guide come with a suggested reading list?" Preschool teacher's guide? No. Mm. No. Um, I don't, well, stepping stones may have some books. Simply K, now Stepping Stones may have some books in it. I'm not 100% certain about that. The Preschool for Beginners, the that has books with it. I've approved like 100 of those in the last three days that have gone through the warehouse. Mm -hmm. So that's got like A is for Adam, D is for Dinosaur, N is for Noah, Creation. Um, it's got Big Thoughts for Little Thinkers. Uh, that has a lot of reading. Just said, I will be praying for you all there at Master Books. We appreciate, we appreciate that. It. Yeah. It's just getting started. It is. And we want everybody to stay healthy. That's the big that's the big thing. Mm -hmm. Keep everybody healthy. Vanessa said, Do you have any suggestions for a reading material for a first year homeschool mom? How can we prepare for our first year? Uh, education Does God Have an Opinion is a really good starting place to really solidify why you're doing what you're doing. Uh, beyond that, there's so much information. You know, in the homeschool movement, there's like pendulums, right? And so you, all of a sudden you find out, wow, there's, there's, um, you know, oh, uh, learning styles. So now we have learning styles. And so we jump in full blast in it and we swing all the way out here as far as it can be. My child's a visual learner and I only need visual curriculums and, and, and da, 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 da. And then, and then over time we kind of settle back into into a healthy spot with it. We've done it a lot of times, whether it was biblical holidays or, or different things like that where we swung hard with whatever was kind of a fad or, or going on, and then it kind of settles down. So just, just, I can't say it enough, give yourself room for growth. Don't expect perfection. Don't, don't hold yourself that you have to be perfect as a, as a home educator. That's not, the, that's not the way this works. It's not the way any of this works. If I'm using God's design for beginners, do I need to get the Adventures in Creation? No. Okay. Um, they're two separate courses, just yep. to clarify. Casey said, what are some good reading goals for second and third grader? We answered that one, didn't we? No, this is a new one, but... It's the same. I would just get your child interested and test, test some different things and see... Um, see what interests the student and, and move that direction. Yeah. Krista said, are the master books more of a social studies versus history? That's the feel I got from the samples. Trying to decide if I want to add it into our curriculum for this year or wait for next. We are doing first grade. Which one is? My story. My story is more social studies. Yep, it's an awareness. Because how do you really move into history if you don't understand the context of my, my family, my, my city, my nation, my world and so the foundation of my story is more learning and just having an awareness it's not memorizing it's it's an awareness of the world around us Sarah said what's the difference between adventures in creation level one and God's design for life beginners they both say K through second I'm looking kindergarten and don't think we need both what would be best to save for next year I can't write yet you don't need both it's more um, adventures in creation is like a general science course um, it's a different style. It's a little bit with Charlotte Mason and Living Stories. It uses kind of uh, an imaginative thinking of what Adam, when he was talking to his children about uh, the early days of creation, when he was talking with God, what that would have been like, and then some hands-on experiments where God's design for heaven and earth or, and God's design for life is more um, just kind of knowledge. It's, it's a little bit more traditional. Mm -hmm than, than the, the other. So they're two different series, choose one or the other. Um, one would be general science, life would be more of a life science. And just to plug um, the adventures in creation science, which is level one. Level two is now available, which is adventures in the physical world, which would be things like mechanical things, the um, uh, 
uh, well, there's weather in here. Um, yeah. Level there's... one, if you go to the Master Books YouTube page, one of our playlists is called Science with Delaney, and she works through all the experiments that are in the level one course. If you want to get an idea for the experiments that are covered in there, they're ball. Um, they're adorable. Um, is this being recorded to watch again later? Because yes. she caught a half of something that she wanted to listen to. So, yep. yes, it will be up in the app and on the Master Witch YouTube channel, correct? Eventually, yep. Um, the Press Fam said, You have a great rewards program. Would you consider having book reps by certain regions to sell your books? Do you already attend homeschool conventions or would you consider it? We, we attend some homeschool conventions. Um, we've looked at doing uh, like home parties. But the, the issue that we have is it's just a matter of resources and supporting that type of thing. Uh, Masterbooks has been very blessed to have growth in the last few years. And um, it's pretty much all we can do to kind of stay with what we have. Catherine asks, any suggestions on how long to spend on homeschooling each day for a fifth grader? Does the book have a breakdown or schedule in it or have y'all created a separate one? Well, you know, homeschooling, like actual book work, I would say, um, depending on the student, three to five hours. Uh, but that could include different things like reading, drawing, some music practice mm -hmm. as well. Um, my son is 11, so going into six, but is way behind in math. He really struggles with basic math facts. He hates numbers and math. She said she just ordered the sixth grade basic bundle and is now working. I'm not thinking she needs a third to fifth grade math instead. Do I get him caught up? This is my first year using Masterbooks. Yeah, I wouldn't be afraid to go back. I, I Cover the learning gaps. Make it fun. Just be like, hey, here's what we're going to do. We're going to do this book as a review. You're going to blow through it because you're already, you are you already know most of this. Mm -hmm. There may be a couple of concepts we don't. Um, and then that's what we're learning to do. And we're going to gain some confidence in this and some skills in this and then give her a award when they get through it. Like, just let them go at their rate. Yeah. Um, Susan said, what is the typical time frame it takes for a kindergartner to complete the Simply K in math? What about the science and social studies? I'm leaning towards adventures and creation in my story. So we don't typically advise, I mean, you can do it, but uh, our course is set up so that it's not overwhelming. So you're only looking at, um, it says, I think it's, let's see, excuse me, I'm sorry. Simply K, I think, it's only like, I'm not sure if it says, it's not very long. It was only like 20 to 30 minutes a day. Could be wrong if Carrie Bailey or somebody's watching that's doing it. Um, could save me this very moment. I would certainly appreciate it. But I, the lessons are meant to be low and not cause uh, a lot of overwhelm, right? The goal is kind of just develop the brain, develop the skills, prepare them to lay a foundation. Once you reach resistance where the person where the student is starting to resist you mm -hmm. and get and melt down, it's to us it's more a point of the brain is not ready to move forward. And so some people will say it's willful and some people will try to force their students through it. Mm -hmm. You may succeed at that, but um, the studies have shown that in grades four or five they tend to regress. Any progress that was made by pushing a student too early, they lose uh, later on. Right. Uh, Jess said, yeah, we're doing it, and it's around 20 minutes. Oh, so, good. Thanks, Thanks Jess. Um, Susan said, never mind, I just asked that. Megan said, my son was in public or kindergarten last year, and I'm having trouble with the Masterbooks math placement. On the Masterbooks level 2 readiness test, he would pass all but the place value and time tallying. Looking at the Masterbooks math level 1 book, he would be bored for the first 60 plus lessons. Anyone else have this problem in the Okay, so the first lessons, the first group of lessons are review. They're meant to help um, just reinforce the skills. And you don't have to do that. Like you could do five lessons in a week or a day. You, like if he can do it, you know, reward the behavior you want. If he does it, yeah, woo, you're smart, man. You did five in a day. That's awesome. <clears throat> Let him go through that um, just to protect. Yeah. You, I would, I would probably err on that side of doing two books in one year as opposed to just, you know, don't overthink it. But if, 
if there's some things that he didn't learn that would be in level one, let him do level one just as a, you could even do it, you know, well, the summer is going pretty fast, mm -hmm. but you could even do it as like a summer type project um, and, and then uh, move on from there. Yeah. Um, Kathleen said, I ordered the basic four core subjects for my seventh and eighth graders. What else should I supplement with um, to be reading on their own as well? A language class maybe? Well, language would be, yeah, you could do a foreign language there. Um, you'd probably want to look at some kind of an art, some kind of a music, do something for phys ed. You want to add those electives that you would have had. Um, and then I would recommend looking at some kind of a Bible. Um, the logic course is one, an elective that you could add. The elements of faith is something you could mm -hmm. add. Um, the, uh, some of the others. Uh, we have some of the Bible courses that you could add. Uh, biographies of faith would be like some of the history, the spiritual history type stuff. You mm -hmm. could add that too. Um, friend said, I'm in love with this program and so are my kids, K and fifth grade. Will there ever be a science kit to go along with the textbooks? I'm not sure which book she would be talking about though. Probably mostly God's design. Mm -hmm. A lot of these are designed to use household items and I've priced out kits with suppliers. They were like $160. And for things like styrofoam cups and stuff like that, I know that we would love to have a kit, but the price was prohibitive for the course and and most of it you know we just don't want people thinking that you got to spend a hundred and sixty dollars because most of it is sitting in the closet and like I said is the cumulative record book okay to photocopy or do I need to order one per child no if it our the copyrights that we have is you can make copies of our products for an immediate family within a household so if you're making it for your students in your household, your, your, your children, you can certainly do that. Uh, Pamela said, I have a high schooler that will be entering 11th grade. I've only been homeschooling for seven months and need help on how to improve her ability to comprehend what she's reading. She struggles seeing past the superficial message of whatever she's reading, poem, book, article, news, etc. Some of that could be just because she's just doing the schoolwork because she has to. It's not really an interest. The question I have is if there's something she's interested in and she watches a YouTube video or she reads a book or, or listens to somebody talk about it, does she get excited and able to talk it back? Mm -hmm. Like there are just some things that we have to do because we have to do them, but we may not enjoy them. Mm -hmm. and just right the reality. But then all of a sudden when we're interested in it and our brains are excited about it, it's like connections are being made. We can't wait to talk about it. If that's the case, I wouldn't worry that much about it. I mean, it's, we're, we're gaining information, but the world has changed. With our phones now, we have like so much knowledge at our fingertips. Mm -hmm. Siri, tell me about nuclear physics. And it's going to give me information about it. So... I wouldn't worry too much about that unless, unless, and sometimes it's short-term memory versus long-term memory issues. Um, I can read a book and not really remember what I read, but then when I go back to read the book, I know every word that I've read, and, and so that's just something I have. So what I do is I make notes of the overall, like I write highlights and I write um, quotes. So the quotes that I take from the books and the front page of all of my important books, there's there's kind of the notes that I use to trigger what I got from the book. And it's just a way that I can pull away the takeaway as opposed to the details. Yeah. I had a friend though, he could do the details. Like he can tell you like what everybody said in a movie and all of that. Um, I think I was better at the takeaways than he was, but uh, he definitely could out detail me. Tyler DL03 said, hello everyone, just wanted to say hello. We are brand new to Master Books this coming year from public school. My prayers are finally being answered and are super excited and a little nervous. Awesome. We are excited for you. Yes. That's exciting. Um, Terry said, is the teacher's guide for the math book necessary? It's the only teacher's guide I didn't buy and the other teacher's guides I have all, no. have all the student worksheets in them. No, it's not necessary. It's just, it's a, um, as a companion, I'm assuming you're talking about the companion. Right, it's right. just helpful. It's not necessary. 
And you could easily buy the digital too and just read the digital. I mean, it, it's not like there's, you know, there's stuff you could even print from the digital if you wanted to. Rachel said, I've seen a lot of positive reviews about the teacher's book. Uh, what is the purpose behind it? It gives you, it gives you some insight what, what they're trying to accomplish with the course. It gives you the recipes that are in the course. It tells you, you know, if you jump in in book three and you're trying to figure out the story, who's related to who and, and what went on in each story, it gives some of that. It gives a little bit more. Um, there's a couple, I think, printables in it. And so it's, it's useful, but not necessary. Alyssa well, asks, what is the difference between the big timeline and Adam's timeline? Well, the big timeline is a little bit simpler. It's, it's from you know, creation to present day, I think even Trump is on there. Mm -hmm. uh, Adam's chart of history is a very comprehensive and detailed history from creation to the early 1900s. Um, very comprehensive. It's 23 feet long. The big book of history, I think, is 12 or 13 feet long. Uh, and Adam's chart has like everything, like wars, personalities, major events, uh, theology, the biblical history. Or the book book of history has some the the, the basic ideas. Vanessa asks, what are your teaching tips for a very strong little child that I expelled from my homeschool last spring, but I'm giving a second chance to starting in August? He is an adorable and very strong-willed seven-year-old. I've done some videos on the strong-willed child on our YouTube channel. I would definitely recommend watching that video because there's enough time that I have to unpack it. Um, right. It's one of our highest viewed ones right now, too. Yeah. And my daughter joined, in that, I'm not sure if it's in that one, but one of the things she said is sometimes we think strong-willed children have the strongest, like they're the strongest, but the reality is strong-willed children often have the least amount of self-control, and that's what they're wrestling with. So it's, it's interesting. Mm -hmm. Lydia yeah. said, would Masterbooks ever consider an audiobook version of history and science textbooks? I'd invest in them in a heartbeat. Well, in the... Um, like right now, Angela O'Dell is putting together a course for American for America's Story. And she's actually reading in that course, she's reading all of the text. And she's going through with like a kind of a bouncy ball and she does it. Uh, and she reads the text to the students. So in the academy, some of the courses will have an audio component to it. Rachel said, concerned about which math book to get for my first grader. First seems too easy, but I don't want to throw him into something too difficult. I'd suggest level one. Let him go at his rate. He'll slow down when he needs to. Okay. Um, Kyle and Jen asks, does Master Books offer a course curriculum? Not sure what that means. Um, Rachel said, does the first grade bundle come with any teacher's guides? No. Uh, Pamela said, Everything you need is in the book. It has teacher instructions. And everything in the book. Pamela said, if we wanna, wanted to move a little faster, could we do both Foundations Phonics and Language Lessons for Living Education in one semester? No. You, if, if, the, if the student knows how to read, you can move in. I mean, it depends on the student. Some students may go really fast through it. So yeah, you could if mm -hmm. the student went through Foundation Phonics and was actually reading mm -hmm. really quickly in nine weeks. Yeah, you could do both. So we have three more questions. I don't questions. know why I would push it, but if you really wanted to, you could. Three more questions on this post. Becca said, what educational philosophy does Masterbooks use? The right one. We, uh, we, we're eclectic. We have traditional methods. We have a lot of Charlotte Mason influences. We, we have some classical influences. Uh, there is no one size fits all, you know? And, and I think um, it's what works. And that's, that's how Master Books was built. Uh, the very, I'll go very briefly on this. Kristen, my wife, was we had owned a business where we sold all of the major curriculums. There are things about all the curriculums that we all love. There are things about Abeka and BJU and Switch on Schoolhouse and Life Pack and, uh, and Apology and all of these things that we love. But then there's friction points that you experience. And so what, what we try to do is create a hybrid of the best of what we loved in all these curriculums and, and remove as many friction points as we can for homeschool families. You know, we don't need to copy what public school does. We don't need the drill and kill. We don't need um, pages and pages of work to frustrate students. We, 
I've, I've worked with scoring and, and trying to understand course design. Some courses are terrible to try to figure out how to teach in 180 days. There's no instruction. So we try at the beginning of every book to have a daily schedule that gives you an idea. You can adapt it, but gives you an idea. Um, we believe that you start out a little bit gentler and allow the student to develop holistically, that their brain develops mm -hmm. not just the academic skill, but also the emotional, the spiritual, um, the, the, the growth skills, all of these things that need to happen in order for good learning to take place later on. Uh, we are absolutely faith-based. If a man gains the whole world, if he learns everything there is to learn, and he does not um, have a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, and that there was a creator, and he had a purpose, and that each of our children were, that were formed and fashioned with a purpose in mind, and that they are special, that God has called them special. If they don't understand that by the end of their academic career, then, then we've completely failed them. And so, woven in all of our curriculum is a strong faith message uh, to build their faith. In fact, we have a faith builder guarantee. If you buy this book and the faith of your child does not grow, we'll give you your money back. Because we know that when you look at the evidence and you point to the evidence in light of God's word and you begin um, showing that, our faith grows. We have so many reports of families who had never even heard some of the things about like the biblical account of creation and that there's evidence that supports the Bible and, and says the Bible is true. And all of a sudden their, their families have grown spiritually. Mom and dad, they're having good discussions, they're growing, they're learning, uh, and, and so that's exciting. So that's part of what we do as well. Awesome. Others said, why isn't there a geography course for high school? I've seen that most take it in ninth grade then go on to other histories. I'm a little disappointed and I'll have to look elsewhere for geography for my 15 year old because Master Books doesn't offer it. We can only do so much. We've, we've, been, we've been doing courses. If you saw how hard our design team has worked since 2012, um, I mean, we have put out so many courses and, and done so much work and continue to improve the product we have. Plus, we've bought other publishers and improved those products. Um, yeah. Ultimately, will there be a course? Yep. Uh, today, there are there are things that we're still working and developing that are core. Um, final question. Anna said, is there a plan to have all books include some type of quiz or test as some of us need to have that in our portfolios? Well, sometimes there's recommendations like in the Math Lessons for Living Education, there may not be a quiz or a test, but it's a review. And you could certainly grade that. Um, you can grade and, and you know, if you did an oral quiz or you did the review and then assign a grade to it, um, you can do that. Now, with Math Lessons for Living Education, the Practice Makes Perfect Packs will have quizzes and tests for people who want them. Um, it's not necessary, it's just something that people have requested, and so we're working to put that together to make the course more robust mm -hmm. for those families. Yeah. Sarah and Ham, which I do believe she's been on here the last few weeks. So thank you for coming back and listening and joining the conversation. Yes. She just said thank you so much for today. It's been great listening to everyone's questions and to hear your answers. Awesome. Well, thank you. Hey, it's been fun to have. We did this in an hour and two minutes. We did. That's awesome. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, hopefully this helped. And... Um, we appreciate your time. We appreciate serving this community like you don't know. And uh, we look forward to what God is doing this year. I believe firmly that the homeschool movement is a revival that God has, has he's used. It's like when he took Moses, when, when Moses' mother took, took that baby and put him in a basket and covered him up and pushed him out, and that was such a sacrificial act to do that, but it, it preserved him. And, and I believe that homeschooling in so many ways is like that. It's, it's, it's been this grassroots movement that the church, in most cases, the church has completely missed because they considered it homeschoolers could be hard to handle or it was divisive or whatever. Um, it's been this, this, there's this culture of a generation that's been taught God's word and truth. And... Um, and now to see that God is even taking the, 
you know, the public school system and, and, and people are moving into homeschooling, we just have this huge opportunity. We know not everybody's going to homeschool forever, and we know, but if we can just plant seeds, <coughs> and we can do what we do and, and, and pray for harvest, I'm excited by that. So when, when we go down and we're packing boxes and we're exhausted at the end of the day and we're taking a lot of calls and, and just trying to educate a lot of people, it's exciting because that, this is unprecedented. There's never been this kind of growth in homeschooling. We've served this market for over 20 years and, and I've never seen anything like this. And uh, you know, it's, you wonder what, what it'll all look like in the end. But at the same time today, I have the opportunity to invest and in, in, in to uh, make an impact in the kingdom. And so that's what, that's what our goal is. Awesome. Good. Yeah. All right, guys. God bless. Uh, teaching tips on Thursday. I don't fully know the title, so I'm not going to give it to you. But there will be a teaching tip on Thursday. So.